There are few single images in the history of comics that have quite the same impact as the death of Jason Todd. This infamous moment brought to life in the pages of Batman issue 428 is one of the most instantly recognisable in the Dark Knight's 80 plus year history, rivalled only by the death of his parents and the paralysing of Barbara Gordon in The Killing Joke. In the 32 years since it was first told, this story, best known as a death in the family, has sent major shockwaves throughout the entire world of DC Comics, forever changing the way that not only Batman stories were told, but how the entire company approached its storytelling for many years. It's a now iconic image that has continued to massively impact these characters for multiple decades without interruption. However, I think the story of how this moment came to be behind the scenes is even more fascinating as the one told within its pages. So in this video, I want to explain the history behind Jason Todd as a character, the factors that led to his infamous death and the unique circumstances of how this story came to be, what the legacy of a death in the family is and how it still serves to be one of the most significant and important moments in all of comics and how it still impacts the medium today. Before we continue though, just a quick reminder to leave a like on this video if you enjoy it and subscribe to Owen Likes Comics so you don't miss out on any future videos. So in order to understand the significance of a death in the family and the unusual circumstances surrounding how DC chose to kill off Jason Todd, it's first important to understand the origins behind this character and the factors that led up to DC putting this story in motion. You see, in November 1980, Marv Wolfman and George Perez relaunched the Teen Titans, a team of young, often sidekick superheroes that was first published in the mid 1960s. This version of the team though, christened the New Teen Titans, is probably the most well-known iteration, featuring a lineup consisting of Beast Boy, Cyborg, Raven, Starfire, and their leader, Robin. Dick Grayson, the original and only Robin at this time, became a focal point of this New Titans series, and as such, saw his appearances in the ongoing Batman comics become more sporadic. Jerry Conway, the writer of Batman at the time, wasn't a huge fan of Robin's diminishing presence in the series, believing that the character was a necessary aspect of the Dark Knight stories, stating that, I always felt that Batman worked really well with a sidekick like Robin. My interest in the character was the version of Batman as a detective, the version of Batman as a guardian of Gotham. This was prior, I believe, to the deep dive into the Dark Knight kind of concept of Batman. So for that end, the idea of a younger sidekick who could bring out a little more levity in the character seemed useful. But Dick Grayson as a character had grown into a young adult and he was integral to the Teen Titans series and had his own life and his own storylines that were developing separately from Batman and he couldn't really play that secondary role that I was interested in exploring. As such, DC decided to replace Dick with a new Robin exclusively for the Batman comics, and in Batman issue 357 from March of 1983, the world was finally introduced to his successor in the form of Jason Todd. Created by Jerry Conway and Don Newton, Jason Todd was, upon his first number of appearances, virtually indistinguishable to his predecessor, often being drawn as completely identical to Dick, save for his red hair, and even being characterised as a former circus acrobat and a member of the Flying Todds. However, it should be noted that this version of Jason Todd didn't actually last for very long, as in April of 1985, DC began to reboot the comics universe with a story called Crisis on Infinite Earths. The post-crisis DC universe as such quickly became a place for writers to reinvent various characters, free from the years of continuity that would otherwise have preceded them. Denny O'Neill, who took over as editor of the various Batman comics in 1986, sought to use this as an opportunity to revitalise the Batman character and return him to his darker roots, stating that there was a time right before I took over as Batman editor where he seemed to be much closer to a family man, much closer to a nice guy. He seemed to have a love life and he seemed to be very paternal towards Robin. My version is a lot nastier than that. He has a lot more edge to him. 
O'Neill's darker take on the Caped Crusader didn't just stop at Batman himself, instead it extended to his supporting cast as well, as he was keen on reinventing Jason Todd in order to improve his popularity with the readers. You see, following Jason's creation in 1983, fans were still largely lukewarm to him as Robin, often believing he was nothing more than a pale imitator of the beloved Dick Grayson. As such, O'Neill and writer Max Aaron Collins sought to bring Jason back in a way that would make him his own unique character, retelling his origin in Batman issue 408 with a noticeably more rebellious and angsty edge. In this story, Todd is depicted as a young rebellious orphan who is caught by Batman after trying to steal the tires from the Batmobile. This version of Jason was, from his first appearance, designed to be almost the antithesis to Dick Grayson, with Collins noting that, I believe the Street Kid thing was my idea. The notion being that Batman slash Bruce Wayne did not want responsibility for putting Dick Grayson in harm's way anymore. But this new Street Kid was already in harm's way and heading toward the wrong road. So taking him on, and it was a gradual decision, made sense. Not long after his reintroduction, Jason was quickly re-established as Robin, teaming up with Batman to track down Two-Face, the man responsible for his father's death. However, almost as quickly as he was brought back into the comics, did problems arise regarding Jason behind the scenes, as writer Collins left the Batman title not long after this and was replaced with Jim Starlin. Stalin, who would write Batman from 1987 to 1989, was not a particular fan of Robin as a character, and as such would only use Jason sporadically throughout the initial year of his run. As he explains, I tried to avoid using Robin as much as I could. In most of my early Batman stories, he doesn't appear. Eventually, Denny asked me to do a specific Robin story, which I did, and I guess it went over fairly well from what I understand. But I wasn't crazy about Robin. As tensions began to arise between Stalin and O'Neill, it became apparent to everyone that Jason was very unpopular with DC's readers, and as such, Stalin, when he did feature the character, sought to play on the growing displeasure by presenting him as more and more unlikable. This is best demonstrated in Batman issue 424 from October 1988, a comic which saw Robin apprehend a South American drug trader and seemingly push him to his death. This story proved to be incredibly controversial and seemingly heightened the existing hatred that many had towards Jason at this time. At this point, even Denny O'Neill couldn't deny Jason's unpopularity, acknowledging how they did hate him. I don't know if it was fan craziness, maybe they saw him as usurping Dick Grayson's position. Some of the male responses indicated that this was at least on some people's minds. I think this is taking the whole thing entirely too seriously. It may be that something was working in the writer's minds, probably on a subconscious level. They made the little Brad a little bit more disagreeable than his predecessor had been. He did become unlikable, and that was not any doing of mine, but we became aware that he was not very popular. Once we became aware of that, of course, we began playing into it. Almost as soon as Batman issue 424 hit shelves, it became clear to those at DC that something had to be done with Jason Todd. And while Stalin and O'Neill began to brainstorm different ideas, nobody quite expected just what would come next. The beginning of the end for Jason Todd began soon after in Batman issue 426. In this comic, Batman and Robin's relationship continues to break down, with the Dark Knight fearing that Jason's anger and aggression is becoming out of control, leading to an argument between the two, which results in Robin being relieved of his duties. As Batman resumes crime fighting alone, he attempts to track down the Joker, as Jason discovers that his mother, who he had long thought to be dead, is secretly still alive, and follows a series of clues around the globe to attempt to find her. Jason follows the clues to the Middle East, where he reunites with Batman, who has followed the Joker to Ethiopia, believing he is selling stolen arms to terrorists. Batman and Robin reconcile and team up to track down Jason's long-lost mother, an aid worker named Sheila Haywood. However, Jason discovers that Haywood has been secretly blackmailed by the Joker, and while Batman attempts to intercept the Joker's convoy of arms, follows them to a warehouse, where he reveals his superhero persona to his mother, attempting to rescue her. 
Shockingly, Haywood betrays Jason, luring him into the warehouse before handing him over to the Joker. Joker and his henchmen then proceed to beat Jason mercilessly. With Robin severely injured and unable to move, Joker orders his men to fill the warehouse with explosives. He also betrays Haywood and ties her up in the warehouse with her son. As the villains flee, Jason slowly comes to, desperately trying to untie and save his mother before the bombs detonate, freeing her just in time, but unable to save himself. As the timer ticks down to zero, with Jason still trapped inside. Batman having intercepted the convoy and prevented the arms deal, witnesses a huge explosion in the distance, racing over there to check on his partner. Batman issue 427 ends with a cliffhanger ending, as the Dark Knight desperately searches through the rubble for his partner, with Robin's fate being left open-ended. The final page of the comic featured a full-page advert advertising two 1900 numbers, asking readers to call one depending on what they thought Jason's fate should be. As the page's headline reads, Robin will die because the Joker wants revenge, but you can prevent it with a telephone call. The idea of leaving Jason's fate up to the readers and having them decide via telephone actually stemmed from Denny O'Neill, taking inspiration from a 1982 Saturday Night Live sketch, which saw Eddie Murphy ask viewers to vote over the telephone on whether he should cook or spare a live lobster. At this time, O'Neill and Stalin had been clashing for several months on what to do with Jason Todd, with Stalin heavily advocating that the character be killed, and this method, allowing the fans to decide, ultimately seemed like the best way of resolving their problem. As such, Stalin and artist Jim Apero created two alternate endings for Batman issue 428, one where Jason is revealed to have survived the explosion, and one where Batman discovers his lifeless body. On Thursday the 15th of September 1988, the two 1900 numbers went live, with over 10,000 Batman fans calling in to determine the fate of Jason Todd. When the lines closed the following night, a grand total of 10,614 votes had been cast. And while it was close with only 72 votes determining Jason's outcome, the result was that Jason was to die. And as such, Batman issue 428 opened with Bruce finding Jason's body and discovering that he had died, cradling his fallen son in a now iconic image. With such a slim margin deciding the outcome, it's no surprise that public opinion was split regarding whether or not Jason should die. While many fans had been vocal in their displeasure towards him throughout the decade, there were also many who didn't believe his death was necessary. O'Neill recalls how in the aftermath of a death in the family, We got a lot of hate mail and hate phone calls after Batman 428. I got phone calls that ranged from you bastard to tearful grandmothers saying my grandchild loved Robin and I don't know what to tell him. That broke my heart. The mood truly did range from heartbreak, anger, elation and regret, but in the end the deed was done and there was no turning back. Jason was gone and everyone at DC was resigned to letting the character go and using his passing as a way to re-emphasize the tragedy at the heart of the Batman character. Denny O'Neill would remain editor of Batman until 2000, and despite him being initially reluctant to kill Jason off, the notion of him being revived was never suggested throughout his tenure. As the years passed, Tim Drake was introduced as the third Robin, Bruce repaired his relationship with Dick Grayson, and Jason's place in the Batman mythos became that of a harsh reminder of the very real danger that crime fighting brings. However, as all comic fans know, dead doesn't always mean dead, and Jason did come back to life in 2005, now as the violent anti-hero, the Red Hood. Nevertheless though, I still think A Death in the Family is one of the most noteworthy Batman stories ever told, and it did a considerable amount to further humanise and ground the Dark Knight in realism. His war on crime had real stakes, and as such, it forced both the character and the writers at this time to reevaluate the way he acted. Alongside other seminal Batman stories from this period, such as Alan Moore and Brian Boland's The Killing Joke, and Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, Stalin and Aparo's story has had a long-lasting impact on the Batman character, one that continues to inform the way he's depicted today. 
I actually think a lot can be said about the influence of these two other stories on A Death in the Family, as The Dark Knight Returns, first published in 1986, was the first comic to kill off Jason Todd, with in this out of continuity dystopian epic, Bruce forces himself into retirement for a decade following the loss of his partner. Likewise, the monumental success of The Killing Joke, published only months prior to a death in the family, and the seismic status quo change that was Barbara Gordon's paralysis, likely inspired Starling, Aparo and O'Neill to tell a somewhat similar story in the main continuity books. And while as a story overall, I don't necessarily think A Death in the Family is quite as cohesive as these other comics, I do still think it's one of the most significant Batman moments ever told. What the legacy of A Death in the Family truly is though, remains up to debate, as much like they did at the time, many remain uncertain as to whether or not Jason's death was the right thing to do. Frank Miller notably criticised the story's approach, stating that, A Death in the Family should be singled out as the most cynical thing that particular publisher has ever done. An actual toll-free number where fans can call in to put the axe to a little boy's head. To me, the whole killing of Robin thing was probably the ugliest thing that I've seen in comics, and the most cynical. While countering this, Jerry Conway, Jason Todd's creator, actually praised the decision to kill the character off, likening how his memory was used in the years after his death to that of Gwen Stacy, stating that, I was more interested in Jason after he was killed off and he was brought back as various reinterpretations of the character. That seemed, to me, more interesting, because honestly, he was, at least before he was killed, not that well developed as a character. Much like Gwen Stacy, he's someone who is more interesting in death than he was as a character in his original state, and I think that's valuable, so that works for the character. If he had just continued as a sidekick, I don't think he'd be very interesting. Personally, I tend to agree with Conway here. Overall, I don't think the writers at the time ever quite knew what to do with Jason Todd. In his early years, he was little more than a stand-in for Dick Grayson, and while the likes of Max Aaron Collins and Jim Starlin did inject some much-needed personality into him, he didn't necessarily endear himself with the readers. By killing the character off in such tragic circumstances, Jason became immortalised as a vital part of the Batman mythos, a constant reminder of those we lose and those that we fight for every day. And even once the character returned as part of the Under the Hood storyline, this dynamic remains a core part of the Batman character and forever changed the way that the Dark Knight stories were told. And regardless of whether or not you agree with the initial decision to kill Jason off, I do think given the legacy of this story some 30 years later, it's genuinely hard to argue that a death in the family is anything less than one of the most significant and impactful Batman stories ever told. Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and leave a comment down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on everything we talked about in today's video. I can't wait to hear what you have to say as always. If you're new to Owen Likes Comics, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and the notify bell so you stay up to date with all of the new videos we release on the channel. And if you want some more videos, there should be some on screen right now that you might also enjoy. I wanna give a big special thank you to all of the talented creators who lent their voice in bringing this video to life. Links to all of their channels and socials will be in the description, so please do go and check all of them out. If you want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter, just at OwenLikesComics, and if you want to help support the channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash OwenLikesComics. That's all for me though, thank you all so much for watching today's video, I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, take care, and keep reading.